Thank you very much, Michael, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here uh, today with uh, uh, new friends uh, and old friends, but an industry that uh, is incredibly important to, to Australia and to our future. You know, we're blessed as a nation, aren't we? We have political and social stability. We have a talented and educated workforce. We have abundance of, national, of natural resources. Uh, we have easy proximity to some of the world's largest uh, and fastest growing markets. We have significant disposable income in Australia compared to uh, the rest of the world. And we've had 24 years now of consecutive growth. No, there's only one country in the world that's done better than that, and that's the Netherlands, and they're at 27. Uh, and so, and Australia's still growing, so we might just tip them at the post. But what that's done to Australia, I think has made us a little bit complacent. That we've been through a range of quite dramatic events, global financial crisis, tech bubbles, Asian crisis, all sorts of things. And yes, they've affected our economy, but not nearly to the extent that has been the case for other similar countries around the world. So I think that right now, our nations are at the crossroads. Now, those are words that are used far too often, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I believe that's the case and what we need to do about it and why you are absolutely fundamental uh, to, those, to those changes. I think we have to accept that the years um, of simple growth or easy growth, reliant on a mining boom, positive terms of trade, uh, and so on, um, are over. Now, what those years did, those 24 years of consecutive growth did, meant that our quality of life over Australia over the past few decades has continued to increase. So our quality of life in Australia is significantly better than it was uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it's still easing up. But I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So um, our quality of life is significantly better than our parents or our grandchildren. Our challenge now is to ensure that for our children and our grandchildren, that they can see the same sort of uh, quality of life that we have today and the same sort of increases that uh, we've had. Now, to do that, Australia's going to need to make some very uh, quite fundamental changes. Australia, historically, has ranked highly in international me measures of competitiveness. Uh, you know, we have pretty decent infrastructure, uh, we, or we did have, bit of, bit of a problem um, over the last few years, but um, infrastructure was reasonably good, highly educated workforce, and a bit of a can-do attitude. You know, Australia could get on with it. But the rest of the world uh, is catching up, and in many cases, overtaking us. And I think it's really interesting to be here in Singapore, because Singapore, of course, is one of the parts of the world that has, uh, well, overtook us quite a while ago. But you know, even New Zealand now, well, that's a worry, has, um, has definitely overtaken us. And I'll show you in just a moment, we'll go to that first slide. Now, if you can see that slide, um, uh, right up at the, you know, actually it's around the wrong way. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, the one at the bottom, Singapore is number two in the world. Australia now is 22nd in the world and New Zealand has pipped us at the post. New Zealand has now beaten us. Now this, I think, is a very real problem. Um, when New Zealand beats us at rugby, it's, it's one thing, but when they are a more competitive country uh, globally than us, we have a problem. Interestingly, for those who uh, would ask the question, so who's number one if Singapore's number two? It's actually Switzerland, which is interesting. Little country, but number one in the world. Um, these figures are put together um, each year by the World Economic Forum. Uh, and they're based upon a range of things like um, our institutions, infrastructure, health, education, labour market. Uh, as you can see, uh, six years ago, Australia was number 15 in the world and we're going downwards. Um, other countries are going through um, significant changes and are tracking the, the other way. 
So let's just have a look at a, so the, the, the take out message of this slide is Australia is becoming less competitive globally and countries that are embracing reform such as New Zealand, um, but also countries like, you know, Malaysia, range of others are tracking the opposite way to Australia. Now let's just have a look at the ease of doing business uh, in Australia. Now, great dilemma uh, for Australia is we're getting worse at that too. So the GAP, uh, the World Bank puts these ease of doing business uh, rankings together uh, and the gap, be it's fundamentally the gap between a country's regulatory environment and best practice. Australia's gone from 12th to 13th, Singapore is, is first. Now unfortunately, um, similar, you know, other countries such as uh, New Zealand, you can see those figures, um, actually there, I don't know why that graph's come up that way, it's really, it's really strange. But Singapore is number one, there is a range of other countries such as New Zealand, the US, the UK uh, that, are, um, that are doing significantly better than Australia. So competitiveness is going down, ease of doing business uh, is, is going down as, um, as well. Now why is that so in a country like Australia with all of the benefits we've talked about? Well, I think we do have to come back to uh, complacency, our capacity to take on board, reform, difficult changes has, seeming, has seemed over the last few years to really become pretty low. Now, I don't think this is about particular personalities in politics. I think it's a structural issue. I think that our current or that our political system has, and hopefully it's, it's changing, has tended to discourage boldness or innovation or long, longer term planning. Uh, and I think we've really seen that um, recently in the scare campaign that the union movement ran on the Chinese Free Trade Agreement. I mean, in the end, that came through the other end. But what a tragedy that would have been for Australia if, the, if um, a free trade agreement with our biggest trading partner hadn't actually uh, got over the line. Um, now, this, this graph is, I think, probably the most important graph I'll show you. And look, all of this is available to you in hard copy uh, if, you, if you want it. What this, what this graph is actually uh, showing is that what's happened in Australia is our productivity uh, um, has, um, our productivity growth has reduced quite significantly. Over the years, uh, we've had a 2% or 2.2% annual productivity growth year on year. That slipped to 1.5%. Uh, and predominantly, that's due to a range of issues. Range of issues such as our uh, participation rate in the workforce. We've got a, a more aging people in the Australian e economy, so people who aren't working. That brings down productivity, uh, fairly obviously issues such as falling commodity prices and so on. What this actually means though, is while our productivity rates are coming down and our growth rates are pretty stagnant in Australia at the moment, it means that our quality of life for the first time in 20 years has started to decrease. Now what quality of life means is the dollars per person to GDP. So the number of dollars in the economy for each person really has started to come down. So we are at risk of, re of, of, uh, of giving to our kids and our grandchildren a worse quality of life than we inherited from our parents. I think that is really scary, really scary. So what do we need to do about it? And this is the, the good bit, I suppose, because this is all absolutely um, changeable in the Australian economy, but doing nothing is simply not an option. If we do nothing, we're sleepwalking to disaster um, in Australia, to a lower quality of life, to a scenario where we're not going to be able to reverse some of those fundamental issues in the timeframes that we need to. So what do we need to be able to increase our productivity rate? Now, well, let's have a look at the, the hard ones, but the easy, the easy ones. We certainly need a tax system that's competitive um, and efficient. 
you'd be aware that our corporate tax rates in Australia are amongst the highest in the world, our personal income tax rates are amongst the highest in the world, and our indirect tax rates are amongst the lowest in the world. Um, as, as I think um, Singapore has shown us categorically, that to really be competitive, you need a competitive, you, you need to have a competitive tax system. We don't at the moment, we need to address that. Similarly, we need a workforce that's, uh, that's much more flexible, workplace regulations that's more flexible. The reason we're coming down the competitiveness uh, graph in Australia predominantly is about workforce um, flexibility, which we are way behind. Uh, the way behind the, uh, the rest of Australia or our, com our competitors. Uh, we obviously need a uh, well-trained workforce. We need to better align our workplace, um, our, our training operations with uh, the needs of business. Um, and we need to increase our workplace uh, participation. That's women, younger people and older people. We need more people in the workforce as our population ages. But most importantly for today is we need to make our cities more productive. You know, we talk a lot about uh, our mi the mining industry, but you know, our cities contribute as much to our GDP as does the whole agricultural sector. Now, when you think about that, when we talk about, you know, life after the mining sector and so on, we talk about agriculture, food, a whole range of things really important to the future of Australia but our cities contribute more. And yet, we have cities that are simply not um, as productive as they could be. And I'm sure others uh, will speak more about that um, in, in a minute. Where are we up to with time? Couple, couple more minutes. Okay, so I just wanna, there we go. Lee Kuan Yew, um, you can see the, uh, the the quote up on the up on the screen. Um, Lee Kuan Yew said, "After independence, I searched for some dramatic ways to uh, dis to distinguish ourselves from other third world countries. I settled on a clean, green Singapore. One uh, um, uh, one arm of my strategy was to make Singapore an oasis in Southeast Asia, um, and um, if we had first world standards, then businessmen and tourists would make us." the base for their businesses and their tours in the region. Well, Lee Kuan Yew was a success, wasn't he? What he did was he decided what he wanted to do, what, we, what he needed to do to make Singapore work. Top of competitive, or well, second in, in competitiveness, top of, of easy to do business. Now let's have a bit of a look at what the implications are for Australia. If we do nothing, you know these figures and I'm sure others will bring them up. You know, if we do nothing, congestion costs are going to go up to 53 billion. We're going to see travel times increase by, uh, by 20%. We're going to see demand of public transport, which is fine, go up a lot, but we're going to get to a point where the demand is higher uh, than our capacity to deliver if we don't change and we don't change uh, reasonably quickly in Australia. Transport infrastructure, um, requires us, and this will be, I'll just get through this really quickly, transport infrastructure changes in the way we manage our cities, the planning of our cities, the transport of our cities require our, our um, levels of government to work together. Now, for those of us who have been around that space, we know how hard that is. We believe at the Australian Chamber, what that means is that uh, making our cities more productive needs to be front and centre on the COAG um, on the COAG agenda. That means that we need to get back the COAG reform agenda back onto the back um, front and centre. If our levels of government can't work together, then we can't achieve the changes that you will be speaking about today. And I know that Vic has been, had on the table for a long time. So um, governments working together, the COAG reform agenda back onto, uh, back onto the agenda uh, we desperately need to focus on infrastructure, long-term infrastructure plans. Now, that's again why COAG matters. Uh, you know that Infrastructure Australia has put onto the table a range of important projects that this country needs. So that's something like $300 billion in infrastructure that isn't being built or planned in Australia right now. 
this requires long-term planning. So again, governments have got to get together. They've got to get together with the private sector because governments simply can't plan them on their own. You would have seen recently, or maybe you saw recently, um, Professor Harper's report uh, into competition policy. He suggested that the most important reform that he was suggesting, not Section 46 or a range of others, but was road user charges. That we simply had to bite the bullet in Australia and look at ways that we can move single, you know, single, uh, single driver cars, you know, um, off our roads or make it more expensive and allow us to move people much more efficiency, uh, efficiently around our cities. Um, in terms of, uh, of planning uh, more, more broadly, um, I'm going to, uh, well, John will speak about the 20 minute city uh, and uh, that's obviously front and centre as, uh, um, uh, as Singapore has shown fundamentally without standard plan, without deciding what you want to plan, you can't make things work. The internet, fundamentally important, as is the shared economy. If we're going to make our cities work, we need to bring all of those things together uh, and we need to work as a team, putting pressure on, lev on levels of government to make this, this a reality. Talking about it is not enough anymore. I said before that I don't want to leave a lower quality of life in Australia to my kids and grandchildren. I don't think you want to either. If we are to reverse that, we need to increase our productivity year on year by 3%. We haven't done that since the 60s. Cities are fundamental. Um, productivity of our cities is fundamental to that change and that makes your industry front and centre of the future of our country. Thank you very much.